Okay, here we go. And here we go. Okay. Yeah, our poison pen cup for those of you who are playing. Well done. Up. Hold it up. <laughs> Product placement. We love it. You're damn right, Brenda. <laughs> right. We'll, we'll do that as we um, as we get into this. Right. Are you ready? Right. Are you going to do the intro, Patrick? You have a book, right? Sure. Yeah. Great. No, All right. We're live. Hey, good, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore in Scottsdale, Arizona. And we're here tonight with another of our virtual events. And we're delighted to have the mysterious author, James Byrne, with us to discuss his new book, The Gatekeeper. Um, or just, no, it does have the article, The the gatekeeper it was covered up with my uh, sticker. Uh, and James has been kind enough to sign a batch of books for us. So if you'd like one, I will go ahead and put a link to it in the comments field. Uh, and also, if you have questions for Mr. Byrne, go ahead. It sounded like something from The Simpsons there. Mr. No, Mr. Byrne. Um, go ahead and put hey. it in the comments field. Exactly. <laughs> and um, I'd be happy to ask any questions you might have. So, Barbara, over to you. Oh, thank you very much, Patrick. Now, Patrick showed you the finished book, but I'm going to show you. See, this is the blank cover, but this is the cover that I get in my advanced reading copy. And notice all those very nice quotes and so forth, which are designed to encourage me to pick up this book and read it and then potentially sell it. And the list of people who love this book, uh, Lisa Gardner, Greg Hurwitz, Mark Graney, Steve Berry, Nick Petrie, Meg Gardner, Robert Kreis. I mean, right there, right? Um, and in fact, Mark Rainey was here last night and we talked about it favorably because the gatekeeper is not that different from in overall, whatever I want to call it, in the world. Greg Hurwitz, I think, the nowhere man. And um, although Des, our hero here, is his own character, and to some degree, the gray man. So, you know, there are elements of military fiction in this. Um, but at the same time, it's not really like we're talking about Navy SEALs or other stuff. And maybe, James, how are you on weapons? Because we agreed last night, Mark and I, that you could write these books. But if you screw up the weaponry, you're doomed. And I am dreadful with weapons, unless one considers a stapler as a weapon. Uh, but I, I know nothing about them. I do as much research as I can. And I still about... From time to time, I get caught up with, with a gun that's not supposed to have a safety or that can't take a, a silencer, no matter how much research I do, because it's I haven't shot a gun in five or six years. Uh, and that, it, that was like at a range is all. So um, that is one of those things you try and get as, as close as you can, because by gosh, the people who know will always ding you on it if you get it wrong. Yeah. No, it's really true. I think that's the one thing that criticism will come in for. So. I don't know why my internet connection keeps telling me it's unstable. Maybe it's because it's 112. Um, so in case I go wonky, let me, we can drink each other a toast, right? Here's your chance. <laughs> the, uh, ah, where's your mug? Your coffee, your, your water's uh -huh, on. Look at better. Here. I love it. White mug. There's no question about it. Yeah. And I have the red one and the black one as well, I should point out. Ah, so good. I love it. So James Byrne, the synonymous James Byrne is actually a friend and author of at least two decades standing. And I'm going to discipline myself to call him James throughout this uh, discussion. But um, I love the fact that, that somebody has the courage to do something completely different than their previous work and then knocks it out of the park. Good for you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Well, it's hard not to love Des. I mean, Des is one of the most original heroes uh, that I have run across in, you know, decades and decades of crime fiction. And, um, and, and I was hoping that he would stay true to himself all the way through. But, you know, there's a lot of nervous apprehension as you're moving towards the end of a book and you think, please don't fuck it up. Oh, please don't do that. And then he didn't. I mean, he does. Well, I'm sorry, but that's really, you know, and Des is, by God, stays Des right to the last page. And I was just so happy with that. Good for you. Thank you. Thank you. He went through a lot of iterations. He was, when I first wanted to do this, I want, you know, I read all these guys, Mark Greeny, 
Robert Cray, G Greg Hurwitz. I read all, Nick Petrie. I read those guys. I love them. And I want to do something in that line, but I really wanted to do something that was different enough that it wasn't just obviously taking from those guys. And I took the longest time. It took me to figure out that if I wrote a guy who simply was really in a good mood, that he thinks of himself as the luckiest bloke on earth, and he's a bit of a goofball. He's clearly not nearly as funny as he thinks he is. Um, and he's jovial and he's going through life kind of enjoying it. So when crises happen, he comes up with, with zero amounts of angst. He comes out like, oh, well, I'm here. I should probably deal with this. And then I'll go back to playing my guitar. And, and that once I figured that out, the character began to write himself. Well, that's an excellent point. I really love this Cherry Gibson, by the way, Cherry Red Gibson. I think, um, you know, if you're going to have a guitar, right, might as well have one of those. But on the other hand, let's let's point out that the book opens with a pretty remarkable action sequence. And so while Des might be in a jovial mood and, you know, and he is a understated um, hero, at the same time, you find out at the very beginning that he's capable of really astonishing and very tough stuff, but he's motivated to keep his people safe. That's really, you know, and, and he reminds me um, of some of the, the gray man is a bit like that. You know, he wants to keep his whole crew safe. That's a good compliment. Thank you. I appreciate that. And Des, I'm not giving away too much here because I explained this right away early in the book. He is called the gatekeeper because he has this one skill set. He used to work with a military organization. I don't say which one in the first book in which he, be, he has the skill set that he can open any door. He can keep it open as long as possible. He can close it when he needs it closed and he can control who goes in and who doesn't. So he's the breacher he, in a breach event. He's the guy who makes sure that all of his troops get in, into and out of where they want to go. And that's the thing that he brings to any situation. Uh, it, 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 there's scientific background. He has higher education degrees in order to know, to know how to do this. Although he has he talks in a street parlance lingo, like a, a fairly uh, uneducated fellow, although he clearly is not. Um, and that was that that was the one element I was able to come up with that I just hadn't seen anybody do before. And I thought, you know, that's that's rife with potential. You can play with that for a long time. You really can. Actually, in watching the terminal list, the opening um, episode of oh, however yeah. many it is, eight, I think, I thought to myself, if Des had been there. I mean, you know, um, it's not that I, I don't think that um, that James is not is not good, but if Des had been there, it would have been a different play. You know, that's a really strong compliment. Thank you. That's I, this is a character driven book. And if you had taken that character out with somebody else, the rest of the book would have gone a different direction. And I do like that he's not cookie cutter and that uh, his personality is what drives the the plot on, even though it's a very complicated plot with lots of bells and whistles, it is character driven. And there wouldn't have been the same book if you'd had a different dude. Like no, that. absolutely not. But you know, the, the whole point of that terminalist thing was getting into the tunnel, breaching the tunnel, and then getting out of the tunnel. And you know, I thought to myself, they need a desk. They really <laughs> did. So, so um, so what fun for you to um, to have thought up this guy and created him. We haven't heard from you for a while. So what inspired you to come back to writing a thriller after kind of a, an absence? Well, I, I really wanted to try something different. And um, my editor at St. Martin's, um, uh, Keith Kayla, the, the legendary, wonderful editor who makes every book better. Yes. All of my books are better because of him. He contacted my literary agent and wanted to know if I had a book in this genre in my hip pocket. And as luck would have it, I was working on one. So um, I thought, you know, this would be a lot of fun to try this. I want to try something a little bit different. Um, and I want to try many things differently. I want the man's from the United Kingdom. So I was writing in dialect. Uh, the book is written in present tense. So it's Des says and Des sits rather than, you know, I'm a trained journalist. Everything's in the past tense in my world. So I just thought it's time to try and change up everything that I do. Let's just just change it up and see what happens. And you know what? It was pretty refreshing. It was it was fun trying it. Um, so those are a couple of things I really wanted to accomplish and see if I could do. The other thing I really wanted to accomplish, and, and uh, I'm no, I don't think I'm giving away too much here. This is not really a true spoiler. But as I introduced the female protagonist of this book, Petra, I realized pretty early on that Des could rescue Petra in Act One, but Petra would have to rescue Petra in Act Three. And once I had that notion in my head that this was not a damsel in distress, that um, there's a one line in the book that if you want to win a battle, you go get a 
tactician and that's Des. If you want to win a war, you get a strategist and that's Petra because in what she's an international bank uh, lawyer. She works for this multinational corporation. She is a foot and a half smarter than he is in the world that she lives in. So the, the second thing I want to accomplish after this kind of jovial goofballish characters, I really wanted a female protagonist I could rescue her early in the book, but she rescues her at the end of the book. Don't think I'm giving away too much to say that. No, I don't think you are either. And of course, a question, I don't want you to answer it, but a question that arose for me was whether Petra was a one-off and Des would be moving on or whether somehow they would stay connected. So I'm hoping that this was at least a two book contract and I will get to find out. And I, I really don't want an answer, but I'm just saying, I think that a reader will, will ask that question when you get to the end. I forgot to mention that um, this is our July Crime Book of the Month, which means that all the people who belong to our Crime Book of the Month Club are going to get a copy because that's the deal. Um, and when you sign up for it, you have to take what we send you. We do give you free shipping, uh, which is a bonus. But I And I try very hard not to do the obvious for the club. You know, anybody, I've, I've seen lots of other clubs and, you know, um, they mostly just do a brain, a, you know, a, a brand name author and don't give it any thought. And I try really hard not to do that. I try to find something different, something they might not have found on their own. Um, and, you know, it's, it's worked, it's worked well over the years. So I'll be interested to see what kind of feedback we get um, for Des because it's not a standard issue uh, military thriller and it's not a standard issue Jack Reacher. Um, you know, um, and I, I think you and, and Keith, whom I've known forever, and who I do, I agree with you, he's one of the best editors there is. If you're watching Keith, yay you. <laughs> um, he works really hard at, at helping his authors be distinctive. Two quick uh, anecdotes about Keith Kayla. One is he's the editor who once said to me, on page 30, you have such and such from this point of view, but on page 312, so-and-so needs to know that. Do you want to change the POV here? Because he's looking at the book from 30,000 feet and he can see the whole, I mean, he knows where the semicolons and the M dashes go, but he's looking at the whole thing, which is remarkable. And the other thing to know about Keith is that he has an encyclopedic knowledge of 1980s trivia, and he's a bit of a goofball himself, and he's hilariously fun. Going out for a drink with Keith Kayla is Definitely, it's money in the bank a good time. He's tremendously funny, but he also is just brilliant. I mean, he's really, really good at what he does. And he started as a bookseller. Aha, uh -huh. right. Excellent training for being, yep, he did, in Texas. Um, excellent training for being an editor. We always try to get together at crime conferences and I've missed him because we haven't been anywhere for quite a while. Oh, so the theater of this book, although we're starting off overseas um, in a, interesting operation. I can't, I can't remember where it is. Algeria is where we are. But eventually we're ending up in the United States. So, you know, you decided to make the main plot spin out here in this country. Why'd you do that? Um, a couple of things. I had been writing for a while, a lot of European uh, centric books because I travel to Europe almost once a year and I love Europe and it's great fun. And so I've, I've done a number of books that were overseas and I hadn't done one in the States. So again, my, my thought about let's throw out everything that is my cliche. Let's throw out everything that is in my wheelhouse and my comfort zone and try something brand new. Um, I will say now, and I hope this doesn't hurt my sales, Los Angeles is not my favorite city in the planet Earth. I, it's just not. So I thought, let's set a book in a place that I don't know terribly well. I've been only a handful of times. Uh, and so I'm going to have to learn more about it than the books that I, you know, I travel to the places I write usually. This one, I hadn't been in LA in years and years and years. So I just want, I wanted to try doing a book in the States. And then secondly, once I figured out that he was from England or he's from the U UK, I mean, um, and then I thought he, what we really fun to make him a true fish out of water, have him here and have him speak like a, a guy on the streets of Manchester so that most of the Americans he runs into say, I don't understand what you just said. What you just said sounds completely alien to me. And I thought there'd be a fun bit of business with him just being orally a fish out of water, as well as a guy with a kind of different skills than everybody. So that was that I had, I had done an iteration of this that took place in London. And then when I realized that he was from uh, the UK, I thought, no, 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 no. Let's put him in. Let's put him in L.A. Well, your plot, which we can't reveal much of, your plot wouldn't actually work if it weren't in California. I mean, you know, the way it takes that particular landscape and particular geography, political and physical in California to make this plot 
work. But let me say something about Des. I mean, I, I spent a lot of time in England. Des is a bloke. And, you know, that's a particularly English thing. Um, and, you know, blokish is, it's not a pejorative or anything, but um, I don't even know if I can describe it all that well, but I was very comfortable with Des realizing that he's a bloke. Um, and you've obviously spent enough time there to sort of figure that out, but he's, he's, it's, not, it's not American. I mean, blokes are not generally um, American. They're definitely um, a type, you know, they're the guys that go down the pub and, um, you know, in that idiom and, um, you know, they're, they're self-confident in, in their own way. They're not all that interested in um, recognition. You know, I, I was thinking once I looked at the photo of the shooter in Highland Park and I, when I looked at him, I thought how terrible, you know, because he probably doesn't fit in anywhere. And, you know, all that, all that anger or rage or whatever that, you know, he channeled into such a horrible act. But how would it feel if you never felt like you fit in or you belonged? But a British bloke doesn't feel that way. You know, I mean, he just he's comfortable being a bloke. Yep. And he's he's very confident in who he is. And he's and he's confident in his own skin. And then to make sure you don't cross over and to make that toxic masculinity is is the key because yeah. it, uh, you could very easily then make him ob obnoxious so i had to, i had to be a little cautious about making him a bit of a goofball and a, and, a, and a, um not quite as funny as he thinks he is and i also wanted i mean no disrespect to lee, lee child i think he's a brilliant 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 writer but you never see reacher do anything he's not great at lee made the decision early on that i'm never going to show him doing the stuff he can't do. Can he sing? I don't know, but we're never going to see because that's not his gift. So, so I really wanted to show us him doing stuff that he's not terribly good at. I wanted him trying an American accent that sucks. I wanted him to um, try some jokes with people and the people didn't understand what he meant, didn't understand his, his, his rhythms. The other thing I did, and I don't think, I, I think I can tell your audience this. Um, I really, how do I word this exactly? I wanted a character who was deeply uncool when it came to women and sex. Um, though I really wanted to, when a, there's an opportunity for sex, I wanted Des to suddenly become 15 years old and think sex, that would be awesome. Yes, please. Because I had not seen that in an action adventure book either. A guy who completely and totally loses his cool around women. And I thought, well, most of us are actually like that. So I could identify with that. Uh, um, uh, so that was, that, I don't know, he, he is a bloke. That's really, really well put. That's exactly right. <laughs> Your whole world is men, and women are fine oriented towards women, right? Yep. There goes my internet again. There, it's back again. Um, I mean, blokes are are guys that hang out with other blokes, um, and you know, they're they're. I think they're loyal to women. You know, I, but they but they're not skirt chasing the strip club or whatever it is. They're down at the right. pub knocking back brews with other guys, and um, probably not terribly sophisticated with women. But but generally, if there's a woman. You know, they they tend to be that way. You brought up Lee. You know, I've always thought <clears throat> it was one of the great ironies that a guy from Birmingham has written like the quintessential American character. Lee should be writing the bloke. And you should be writing Reacher, you know. I mean, it's so funny. It really and is. it works out that way. He never talked about that, you know. It's just astonishing to me that, that um, you know, he does that. And Andrew, whom I dearly love, Andrew is, is more blokey than Lee. And so it'll oh, yeah. be interesting to see as Reacher, you know, how much he might change as we go along. I got to tell you, honestly, I had read four-ish Reach your books. And then I met Lee Child and he said, hello, how do you do? And I was like, get out. <laughs> I had no idea because his Americanisms are spot on. I was blown away <laughs> the first time I realized. Yeah, it's yes. that. Well, it's true. He's, he's a real, um, he's a real chameleon. And, um, you know, I, I think they cast the new Reacher far better than, you know, the original movie thing. But you can see even in that, that while the guy 
the female cop, who in my opinion is the heart of, of that whole thing. And I'm, I'm crushed that the structure of Reacher demands that she isn't going to reappear. I'm, I'm wondering if the people doing the movies will decide to, you know, to overcome that. I doubt it, but they might. But I mean, he, you know, he, he relates to her. They have, you know, but you know that he's, she's not going to take over his life. You know, he's, he's got an interlude with her, but he's, he's going to move on because that's who he is. He's going to walk out of town and, you know, and leave her behind. And um, there, there are so many series where the hero is, you can even see it in the nowhere, man, you know, where the hero is hung up on um, or enamored or whatever you want to call it, attracted to in love with whatever, with a particular female, um, which is great in some ways, but limiting in others. So that's one reason I'm going to be really interested to see what you do with Petra, who is such a great character. But, you know, is she going to be like like the female cop in Reacher and we'll move on or not? Don't tell me. I can't be. Um, yeah. you know, I, it, it, everybody does, comes at that from a different angle. Um, and one of the things that I think people know, or have not, well, if they quite understand this about the Lee Child Reacher books is they are the quintessential American Western where the hero rides into Absolutely. town, sees an inequity, solves it and rides into the sunset. And so he wrote a 21st century uh, American Western. Shane, that, it's Shane. It's totally Shane. It's totally Shane. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. And um, it, it, once you get that structure, then you can begin to see that, that the, the, in the American Western, the hero is not allowed to stay and benefit from the good that he's brought to the community. He moves on. That's that. That's one of the. That's the one of the tropes of that Western. And so, you know, reach that's your. That's right. You get Jack Palance, the original Man in Black, but basically, you know, you're going to have to have some version of Jack Palance. Um, Right, you know, in the town, and Shane comes in to to clean it up. But you know, the genius of that design is that while you get to retain a series character, every book is a whole book into itself. You know, because there's there's almost no continuing character. Every place is different. There are no ties. You know, he has a few to the army. There's been one or two to his family. But basically, you know, he gets on the bus. And he pulls into town. And then like in the second book, he walks down the street and somebody comes out of the dry cleaner, you know, and bang. So the, what makes Reacher work is while other people would step over the guy that comes out of the dry cleaner, Reacher stops and decides he's going to fix it. So, you know, it's that combination of um, itinerant and fixer that makes him, I think, work. And one of the things I really wanted to do is something that Lee did, which is if you were to pick up the second book, which is written in Keith Hazard, or the third book that I'm laboring through right now, and read that first, you'd be fine because uh, it's in a different city. There are characters who return. Um, I shan't tell you who, um, but I, I do. I want to do that thing where if you pick them up in the wrong order, you're going to be fine. Uh, each of these is going to have a beginning and middle and end, a nice proper parabolic arc to every story. And so it's, it's the order in which you read them, you'll be fine. And that was one thing that some people do really brilliantly. And, I, and I, I'm hoping to emulate that. Well, I certainly hope you will too, because they're so much fun to read. But give us, uh, without spoilers, we've talked a lot about Des. So we already know that, you know, Des is a bloke, astonished by sex, uh, you know, um, wants to fix things. Um, and what's his opportunity in this book? Just give us the setup. Well, um, he's um, wandering around the United States. He's retired at 35 from a military and he's got a guitar and he's playing pickup gigs in bars and he stumbles on a, uh, a, a kidnapping in progress. Being the dude that he is, he feels, it's, he feels obligated to get involved. Uh, and so he does. And then once he is involved, uh, what he discovers is the woman whom he rescued in, the, in chapter two, chapter three, um, is the chief legal counsel for a company so large that is essentially the bank for the world's militaries. It funds the military industrial complex. And uh, she, this, the woman Petra, uh, is surrounded in her entire life by people who are part of that world. Her father created the company. He's, he's the CEO. Uh, she's deeply enmeshed in it. Something's gone wrong. There's money missing. There's been money missing for a great deal of time. She's not sure what to do. And now she's found this dude who's completely unconnected to that life who has saved her once 
and and then walked away and didn't ask for anything. He just did it. Um, uh, and she decides you might be the guy who can help me. So she enlists him. And as he begins to unravel why this one attack happened, he finds that there's a much bigger story going on. And it's going on not in Los Angeles, but in the middle of California in a fictional town that I created and just made it a, just the world's crappiest little town. I feel terrible about it, but it's a fictional town. So that's fine. Um, uh, and um, now he feels I've seen something else that's big and weird and wrong. There's no reason why I shouldn't get involved with that as well, because it, it seems like it needs fixing. So then he travels into that. He's still involved with Petra's story, but Petra's story now becomes really uh, a, a satellite of the larger thing that's happening. Um, and so that's, that's what propel, propels him in act one into her life and then in act two into the larger plot. And you can right, see that. Is, I think the larger plot is extremely well conceived. Um, hopefully it will never come true, um, but actually there's been hints of it um, in various scenes across the United States. And that's a really scary thought. Yes. Um, so in some senses, your journalistic training kicked in, right? Because you've obviously, as a journalist, had to think about the scenario in one form or another. I, I wrote the book before some of the events of, to which you refer happened in real life. Um, and uh, at the time, one of, my, one of the persons who reads my books told me, she, she said, I think that goes a little, it's a little over the top. I don't think that can happen. And then a year later, she <laughs> right. boy, did I wish I was right. Uh, so um, yeah, no, I, 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 am, I am by training a newspaper journalist and I do try and keep my books. I, my joke is I would try, I've set my books about five minutes in the future. So the things that are going on uh, in the book, I, for instance, there are several passages in the book where uh, Petra is talking to a Russian and she's talking about a pipeline in the Donetsk region of the Ukraine and Luhansk region of Ukraine. Well, all that stuff's in the news today. <laughs> it wasn't when I wrote it, but th those sectors are very much uh, part of what's going on in the real world today. And there really are pipelines through that area. And so um, as, a, as a journalist, I do try and, and get hone to a real politique look at the world when I can, and then set my fictional funky stuff just on a schmear, just a patina about what's really going on in the world. And that's kind of my, that's sort of my comfort zone. In this instance, um, I, the, the writing did presage some stuff that I wish hadn't happened and has, so. Well, but you know, that is a conundrum for anybody writing international thrillers is that real events can overtake what you're writing um, while, you're, while you're writing it or after you've written it, in, you know, it's in production. Brad Thor and I had a really interesting discussion Monday night when we launched Rising Tiger and he has this long, um, paragraph because it begins with a Chinese incursion into, um, into India and they, there's a kind of a agreed upon demarcation line and it's constantly being the Chinese are doing their silkworm thing, you know, where they're constantly nibbling away in order to gain territory. And anyway, he has this whole thing about the Chinese Communist Party and Z and so forth and, um, and how they have to because it's basically kind of a failed state, they have to keep going and do stuff like this in order to keep power. And, you know, he might as well have been writing about Putin in the Ukraine. I mean, whatever, what he said about China is 100% true about what we're seeing. And, you know, and it, it's an interesting idea that real events overtook us in the real world, but in a slightly different form, which makes you also realize that these various authoritarian governments are really not any different one to another. It could be Erdogan in Turkey or Orhan in Hungary or Kim in North Korea, Putin in Russia or Xi in China. They all want to be there forever. They all want to die in office. They want to be as powerful and as rich and as all conquering and awesome as they can possibly be. And, you know, they're all going to die. It's not all, you know, there's no way they can avoid that. That's so, a really good observation. Um, yeah. Those right. guys are and, you know, I'll tell you what, where you could really learn that. I don't know if you know this story, but I've always been fascinated. And we went to China in 1997 and we went to Xi'an, which is as far as I've gotten on the Silk Road. And I, I'm sorry that I haven't traveled it more, but probably at my age, it's going to be too much for me. But anyway, we're in Xi'an and we go to see the Terracotta Warriors, which are, you know, phenomenal. And while we're there, we become acquainted with the Emperor 
I think his chin, I can't remember, maybe he's Jew, but anyway, whichever emperor he is, the guy that was the first to sort of pull China together and make it a kingdom, and the guy that had the terracotta caught up warriors created. And what we learned from this is that he was immensely powerful, did these enormous engineering projects, created all this stuff, and at some point while he's out traveling, he dies. And they put him, he's in a chariot that's got, you know, a high thing and whatever it is. They put him on ice and they drive him around for like two years, trying to keep him going because they don't want the power struggle. You know, they want him to live forever, so to speak. And eventually they bury him in a hill nearby on a lake of mercury, which is really toxic. And as a result, even though today you could extract, Steve Barry and I had this discussion because he wrote one of his books about the whole thing. To this day, nobody has actually opened up the tomb of the emperor and, you know, archaeologists and the whole bit. But I thought to myself, isn't that fabulous that, you know, that because nobody what to, knew what to do with the power vacuum and because he clearly wanted to live forever, which is why he created the Terracotta Warriors. They iced him down and drove him around. I mean- I've never heard that story. Wow. Yeah. Well, it's a true story. I mean, I was there and it's, you know, it's in a movie they show you. And, and when you're at the Terracotta Warriors at the end of it, you know, there's a, like a cinemascope, um, experience in a you know in a round theater where you get to see it and what they do is they they basically try to bring the warriors well they have actors you know and bring it to life so you can kind of see how it all went but um it, i find it completely fascinating but i also think it explains z i mean that's you know that's an historical precedent that there is in in china um and for all these guys but most of them most of them die very poorly. Think about Napoleon, think about Stalin, you know, a lot of them, they don't, they don't actually die on the throne. And which the, is in fact true, in, which is in fact true in your book, because <laughs> there is a character, there is a character like that. Um, and, you know, so the same power play is on a smaller scale, uh, or maybe not a political scale is true in one of the main characters in your book. Yeah, and there's a, I, I don't, I, I, I'm not a fancy schmancy literature writer by any fashion or form, but it, there is a little bit of a Shakespearean element here, uh, and I, I say that with all humbleness because I'm not sure I quite hit it. But there is a that that character who uh, it wants to live forever and clearly won't, but is not quite aware of that himself. And when his comeuppance happens, the way that it happens, it had to happen. It had to happen. By the means that it happened, uh, it would have it would have been terrible if I'd had Des shoot him and kill him, or if he'd have died in battle. I needed him to get um, his knees chopped out from under him by another by an important character, uh, so that he, so that he was simply humbled at the end and, and left drinking out in the patio, um, liquor. Uh, and and the, what I wanted to do is I wanted to do that rise and then uh, the quick fall of the uh, the king. Uh, and that was um, that was a, that was an element I had pretty early on that, uh, in that in putting yeah. those together. Macbeth is familiar to all of us. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, but it is true. And I and I I also think when people have that kind of power, phenomenal power, they really can't imagine that they're mortal. I think that I think it really affects their whole worldview, and you know, they're convinced that that you know they're the exception. Um, there, there are a lot of plays, a lot of books that are powered by people like that um, because they're greedy. And it was interesting to me that the British kicked Boris Johnson out because I think Boris Johnson was that kind of a guy. Um, and, you know, part bloke and part, part Macbeth, whatever. But I do think it's fascinating that they managed to finally topple him because, you know, he's up until the last minute, it was like, well, Sure, that stuff happened, but it doesn't really matter. It doesn't apply to me, you know. Boris, um, uh, he looks like if you looked up the word doofus in the dictionary, you'd find his picture. But in point of fact, he's from a very old and established family. And he went to all the right schools and he went to yeah. all the right clubs. Uh, he was he was 
bred from an early age to be PM. That was going to be his job. Now it just so happens that he's that he was a political dork, but but he, he's he, they have it even more in England than we have here in the states. And we have badly in the states. He was he was genetically engineered to be a, P, a PM. Uh, all the right schools, all the right clubs, all the right patronages, all the right degrees. And so when he fell, I, one of the, my one of my staff at my newspaper is from England, and he said it's seismic that a guy like that, who is, who in our caste system in England uh, is destined to be, you know, when he was 16, you knew he'd be PM at some point, as would three other blokes in his, or three other gentlemen in his in his club at Eton. Um, so for him to fall because of a scandal is really a big deal there. And um, I, 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 I love the United States. I love our political system. I have a political science degree, but it would be nice if there were some immediate come up in, in the United States, as we have seen recently, where uh, Boris just messed it up badly and Boris is out of a job. <laughs> it's like, uh, I wish ill on no person. Yes. One, can't, one can't help but wish that, you know, if you fail a character test, that that would, um, that would apply. And I, I'm, truly horrified by our current position. And I, I have to say that I think that the January 6th committee has done an amazing job. They've gotten it all on the record. Nobody is gonna be able to wait. And while they temporarily might be getting away with it, in long-term, in historical terms, they're not going to be. It's a real indictment. Um, and I'm wondering, I'm really wondering if it's more of them have to come up and speak if they're not going to start tumbling, you know, like dominoes, because once it starts. Well, and you'll appreciate this, obviously, doing what, what you do for a living and Patrick is on the line and Bill, that the, 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 the brilliance, I think, of the, that commission is not that they've done anything legally smart, because I'm not a lawyer. I don't know what's legally smart. They've created a narrative and the narrative exactly. is easy enough for anybody to follow. It's got an arc. And there's Act One, and there's Act Two, and Act Three, and it's a very clear narrative of a thing that was too big for most of us to grasp. So they've done it in bite-sized chunks that we can look at, and you can step back one and look at the whole picture now in a way that we couldn't before that. And that's been the genius, I think, of that committee is that the, is the narrative that they've created. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point, yeah, James. <laughs> an excellent point, James. Um, and you're right yeah, because. You know, here's the thing, I, I do have legal training and what I can tell you is that the person who tells the best story wins. It's always true in any trial, despite the evidence, despite denials, whatever it is, the person who tells the most compelling story wins, which is why you get some really weird results sometimes, you know, because the best story triumphs over um, real evidence. But in this case, the best story may very well triumph over everybody's attempt not to tell it. Right. right. And, and it's a combination of voices. It's not just one voice, but it's becoming more and more voices. And, you know, you have to, a guy like Pat, how he pronounces his name, Cipollone, you know, which side of the record does he want to go down on? Right. Which side of history does he want to be recorded on? And as the evidence is mounting, it seems to me that more of them are going to want to come down on the right side than the wrong side. There's not enough to gain by staying on the wrong side at this point. Your lips to God's ear. Well, I hope so, you know, but, um, but you're right. It's the power of storytelling. That's an excellent point. Um, and yeah, I mean, we, we have seen the world changed by storytelling. We've seen Uncle Tom's Cabin, you know, we've seen over, over centuries um, that a powerful story can, can do remarkable things, so. There we go. Anyway, I'm delighted to hear you've mentioned it because I was going to wind up by asking you what was going to be next, but you've already mentioned that you finished the second book about this and you're thinking about or you're working on a third. Yep. Uh, the second one is in the hands of my editor uh, and uh, I haven't heard back from him yet on the first, his first read through. So I'm hoping, knock on wood, I'm hoping he likes it. I uh, actually, I, I, I've done something else I've never tried before. I moved the story to Portland, Oregon, which is is my hometown. I love Portland and, and I'd never tried to write here in my own turf. So that was a lot of fun. Book three is in my hands. I'm working on it right now. I'm feeling pretty good about it. I, I think it's coming along rather nicely. I, I don't know if, the, if this is the kind of thing your, your, your listeners and your, your audience uh, knows or cares about, but I'm not a plotter. I always know, and I'm an ex-theater person. So I 
plot in act one, act two, and act three. And I always know what act one is as I go in. And I'm pretty sure I know what the big plot point of act two is, but I never know how the books end when I start them. Uh, and so right now, this one's coming along and it's feeling pretty organic. It's feeling like it's coming together and, and co uh, coalescing. So um, the, I, I, I will tell you that Des is the most fun character to write ever. And if I'm smart enough and, and can just get out of the way, he writes all of his own dialogue. Um, and uh, it's I'm having an absolute blast writing him. And then hopefully, knock on wood, hope against hope, the readers will have a blast reading him too, because uh, he's just he's just fun to write. Well, he really is. And, you know, at the end of the day, not only is the narrative powerful, but um, but the character is readers fall in love with the character. They don't necessarily fall in love with the plot or, you know, it takes, um, it, 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 it takes this person to, they, they have to care about him. They have to be interested in what he does. Um, and to create an iconic character, you don't always read the zeitgeist, you know, it's hard to do that, to write an iconic character for the moment. Um, but I think you've done that with this. I think he is, and and I, um, two or three authors that I really respect, whose names I won't mention, have read this and really loved this. Um, my husband, who is a very tough reader, really <laughs> loved this. Um, so you know, I think he's passed a, a poison pen proof test anyway, which is good enough for a lot of people. And um, and I think I think people will fall in love with him because you know. He does amazing things, but he's really human. So, you know, that's a, I mean, Reacher's not really human. You know, it's possible to admire him and, you know, be amazed by what he does and all, but the ordinary person can't imagine being Reacher. And I think that Des is, is um, because he is so, so human, um, I think that people can really identify with him and you're right I, I love this kind of schoolboy moment with sex and you know his kind of um and he really doesn't want applause he doesn't want um stop that sorry there's my internet again he doesn't want applause he doesn't want riches he doesn't want you know all the sort of normal payoff for some of these guys you know he just wants to kind of get on with his life He's, he's 35. He's done some amazing stuff. Um, he's presumably got some kind of a pension or, you know, he's not hurting for money and he's not a guy that needs a lot of money. And in that sense, he is like Reacher, you know, who does get whatever he gets from the army, which he allows him to um, travel around on the bus and stop at the occasional ATM or however it is. No, he has a bank account. That's right. That somebody puts money into. But anyway, that's important. You know, it's important for a sleuth that they're not busy making a living for this kind of a sleuth, which is why I think so many um, golden age characters were in the clergy. They were a rabbi or they were a priest. It was Father Brown. It was, you know, that kind of thing because they had an income. They had a job, they had a sinecure, they had an income. And part of their job was to look after their flock. And mm -hmm. so, you know, engaging in investigation was not, not a really um, forbidden part of their, um, their workload. So it's important that you've got a guy who has not got a financial issue to slow him down. Huh? He doesn't have to stop and say, wait, you know, if I do this, my income will go south, I'll be broke. Oh, no, what next? You know, because that isn't an issue for him. Yeah, if he had to stop the plot to have a, a committee meeting with his boss at work or over Zoom, it would be really terrible. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Yeah. Or uh, if he had to make a calculus about if I do this, then my my income will go away. You yeah. know, because I mean, we all survival is a big thing, and we all you know we all run on self interest and survival. There's a whole category which I've sort of forgotten of um, of things that drive people, but you know, it's like shelter and warmth and you know money and family and whatever there's a whole kind of a tree um and so if you are not concerned with those real basics then you know it leaves you free to explore the stuff further down the line so he's he's a real free agent and his 
is the, the one thing I really wanted to do is one of his big strong motivations is he's totally, totally attracted to loyalty. So there's a character named Alonzo who is completely loyal to Petra and he and Alonzo end up hitting it off. Then he goes and meets a woman who's the city council pro tem of this small town and she's completely loyal to her town and the two of them hit it off. And then she has a guy that she knows in the town who uh, is a fairly conservative Republican character. So a lot different from some of the characters they introduce and does really likes the guy right at right because the guy's loyal to her, the politician and he's loyal to it. And so the thing that always attracts this guy and will always he'll hone towards it like a radar is a person who who is motivated by loyalty. And so that's why he uh, that's how he makes connections with people. So very true. Well, I think we've said all we can say about Des and about the plot here of The Gatekeeper, which is very good. By the way, I think it's a very good title for this book. Thank you. Was it yours or was it Keith's? It was, it was not mine. Uh, a very funny story. I met Keith at one of the mystery conventions and I, I said, you know, you'd asked if I'm working on a book and I've got it. It's coming along pretty good. And I said, good. What's the title of it? I said, it's Limerick. He said, okay, well, so what's the title going to be? <laughs> so, yeah. Keith oh, okay. what he feels. He never, he never messes around. And he, uh, they, 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 they didn't think that I had an action thriller title. So they, um, they said, come up with something better. And then I came up with the gatekeeper, uh, which and I was already using the colloquialism within the book anyhow. So I was just at, how about we use that? And uh, not to give anything away, but we decided I'm going to try and find titles that involve the words gate and lock and key for the series. I'm going to make that my thematic title going through. So right now, um, Keith has a copy of the next book, which is called Deadlock. And so we're going to try and make that the, uh, the, his, his, uh, his, uh, his being a gatekeeper will be reflective in every title, I knock on wood. I think that's a great idea. Good for you. Um, thematic titles can work, but, you know, you can lock yourself in, you know, A is for alibi, um, <laughs> started a long lockdown there. And so, um, yeah, I think. I think that, that that's got flexibility, but as you point out, thematic values. So I really, I like that. Great moves. Patrick, come join us and see if there's anything you want to add to this discussion. Well, you did just say you'll be locked in. <laughs> kind of proves his point. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I wanted to ask you a little bit. Um, I almost said your, your real name. Um, <laughs> I caught myself. Um, a little bit about your journalism. You know, you referred to that, and and what kind of work did you do? Can you can you talk about what you covered without outing yourself? Yes, um, I, I I was in a high school journalism program, and then a community college journalism program, and and then college, and got a job right out of college uh, in in community journalism right here in the Portland, Oregon area. I've always worked in newspaper newsrooms. I've always worked in the Oregon, in the Willamette Valley, which is the, the kind of the populous hub of Oregon. I'm a newsroom guy from start to finish. Currently, I'm serving as the editor in chief of a paper here in the Portland area, part of a chain of 26 papers. And um, really, I gotta say, I'm the luckiest son of a gun in the world. Cause when I was 20, I wanted to be a journalist or a novelist. And, I ain't 20 no more. And I am both a journalist and a novelist. So I am truly a blessed guy. So did you cover a wide range of different things? You said community, would that just be uh, uh, cultural cultural news? Would it be crime stuff? Everything but sports with a very strong emphasis on politics and education. I've been an education editor. I've been the Capitol Bureau chief for a newspaper in Salem, which is the state capital of Oregon. And so politics primarily, uh, and then po the politics of education have been where I've done a lot, but I've also been an arts uh, and business reporter from time to time. And I've been a columnist and a copy editor and a page designer. At small newspapers, you'll do a little bit of everything. I know how to change the toner in the co copy machine. You know, you do a little of everything at, at, at our level of, of journalism. Um, but but pretty strong emphasis on being an editor. I've been haven't been a beat reporter for like, well, let's not go there. Many a year, I've mostly been um, a, a, a what we refer to as a line editor in the journalism world. A line editor supervises reporters. A copy editor supervises specific stories, and a managing editor supervises editors. So I've been mostly I've been a line editor and a managing editor. Gotcha. Um, let's see, Diane, um, you, you've addressed this partially, but she says, are your plans for a trilogy or a series? A series. I'd like, I would write this thing as long as, as 
as my body holds out. I'm having so much fun. So my plan for this one is to write them until I can. I no longer can write. Uh, God willing, that'll happen. I'm just enjoying them a lot. Where did the name Des come from? I mean, Des oh, yeah. That's a really good question. I, I belong to Bookabub. You know, I get the list every day of the books that are coming out. And it had dawned on me, and I mean, no disrespect to anybody else, but it dawned on me that there is a limited palette of protagonist's names. I mean, I can't tell you the number of Jacks I'd seen in, in a row. And then uh, Johns and Joes and Franks. And, and I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we see those names a lot. We see them for female protagonists as well cat and you know over and over and over again so i thought let's come up with a name that no, i had not seen anybody else use um and uh um i was playing around with a lot of single syllable names uh and and des by way of desmond finally came up and i had read a comic book in the 1970s by a guy named howard chaikin in which there was a ship called the limerick rake and i always remember thinking that limerick was a cool word to speak and you know kids that i'm irish uh, anyway irish american and so i had limerick sort of in the back of my head as a name i eventually wanted to use somewhere down the road and des limerick and then desmond limerick and De desmond aloysius lyric limerick just kind of built from there and once i had it um it, it's right and uh, other i know that other writers have said this on your on in your bookstore too it's the rumble still skin effect until you've got the right name for your protagonist a book won't work and I went through a number of different names that just were fell flat until Des came along. Wow. Is there a single action hero called Bruce? Uh, outside of Bruce Wayne? Uh, none that I can think of. Bruce Willis? Me either. I've always, you know, Bruce somehow or other, always to me, you know, is, is a more cerebral kind of guy you know um but i i can't you're right i'd forgotten about bruce wayne but then he doesn't go by bruce wayne except you know very occasionally um but it's one of those names i've always thought you know just just it just doesn't show up it doesn't bruce banner is the hulk and i'm showing you my my uh literary roots here by going right back to my comic book days <laughs> right why Not a not lot of hermans either yeah that's right they aren't all right Herman Worms or, or something like that. <laughs> you know, our comic books were very formative um, for appreciating stories and telling me when I was a kid, that's what I did. Every Saturday, I'd get my allowance and I'd leap on my, my Schwinn bicycle and I would ride up the streets of Winnetka to the five and dime where there would be a rack. And, you know, and it was so right. exciting because there'd be like Superman or Wonder Woman or Batman or the Green Hornet or whatever. And, you know, grabbed them up and and loved that combination of uh picture and and words um just very powerful as a kid because I, I think i think as a child it makes it easier if you've got the visual as well as the as the words the pictures really helped and of course it keeps the narrative very small it's, there's no question that I'm a better storyteller because of what I learned from comic books. Uh, uh, they, they taught me a lot about how to choreograph and how to pace. Uh, and I am proud that my literary background includes comic books, for sure. Great storytelling. I do. Yeah, absolutely. Patrick, confess, did you read comic books? Yeah. I mean, I went through a phase of reading comics. It didn't, uh, it not, didn't last as long. It didn't follow me into adulthood. Um, but I know that there's a whole area of graphic novels that are, you know, people are telling really interesting stories. I just haven't really explored them yet. Uh, now it's, um, it's kind of coming back. It's another of those cycles in publishing where, you know, something was tremendously successful and then for one reason or another, it cycles down. Now it's cycling back up. You know how much I love hidden pictures, the Recollect book, because the, the drawings of the, the, the child's voice in the book is her drawings. She doesn't really talk much. Or when she does talk, she's not her authentic self. Um, so it's an, it's an amazing book for the story, the way he tells the story. I hope he's going to pursue it. Yeah, me too. Uh, let's see here. Anybody else weighing in? Um, not really let's see here you know what that's about it um not a whole lot of questions tonight that's okay though what were some of your other you mentioned well, uh, i didn't i didn't expect there to be 
-hmm. Yeah, no, I was just going to ask him a little bit about some of your other literary influences. And um, did you always know that you wanted to write in this in this genre? Or did yes, you set out to write the great American novel and then? No, my dad, a uh, high, high school uh, history teacher, loved action adventure books. Dad read um, uh, uh, Bo Jest and The Four Feathers and Gunga Din and that gener that generation of storytelling and dad passed that along to me and said you know this stuff's great and so i always knew that that was my genre i always knew that that was what i wanted to write in the mystery or thriller world from the uh, very early age my mom who is not quite 90 mom's 80 Five eighty-seven, and she goes through three books a week. She's an avid reader, and she remembers books much better than I do too. I've bought the same book three, four times over. I know you guys are booksellers; you like that. But mom actually remembers the damn book she reads. So uh, I grew up in a household where reading was really important, and sharing books back and forth was really, really important. So I knew uh, early, early on, I really wanted to try and be a mystery writer uh, or a, a thriller writer. And even though this book is a thriller, my pivot foot is still firmly in the mystery camp. Well, I think let's just call it crime fiction. I mean, I read obviously your first books, um, which were at least twenty years ago, maybe maybe twenty five or thirty by now. When was your first book? Let, let's not go there. <laughs> let's not go there. Okay. Well, in any case, I've been reading you all along, and yes, they were um, they were crime fiction from the outset. But I think today, you know, Agatha Christie and Jack Reacher live side by side, and you know. Um, it all falls under what, you know, what to me really distinguishes crime fiction is it, that it has a narrative. It has a plot and it has a strong narrative. Um, and that's one reason probably I've read it more than other literary genres. Just be, I, I really like story. I liked, I liked the fact that I got to start this book in Algeria and end up in this book in, you know, Southern California. And the arc of it was a great story. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. It was fun to write. Yeah. Well, if there aren't any more questions, let me just say we do have, despite the fact that most of our signed copies went to our uh, Crime Book of the Month group, we do, I ordered extras because I like it so much. So we do have copies. And I will tell you that you don't want to miss the first and what I think is going to be a hugely successful series. So this is the time to buy in because you won't get another chance, right? Right? <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, good night. It was great to see you.